I hope that you are ready. By the way, this is Grizz football. By the way, so I hope you're ready for our new series, uh, Get in the Game. We're going to have fun uh, with this one. There is much to learn from sports and the Christian life, uh, and you're going to discover some of those things. You should always be looking at life and trying to find spiritual principles. If the only place you're looking for the spiritual is on Sundays, that's not Christianity. Christianity is your life because Jesus is your life. He's the hub. And this, what we do on Sunday, this is part of what we do, but it's not everything we do. And so uh, we are going to be uh, talking uh, about getting in the game. We're going to be looking at a lot of uh, people in the scriptures uh, over the course of the next several weeks who God called to get in the game. Uh, and so today we're going to focus our attention on teams, hence Jersey Sunday and your team colors and all of that kind of stuff. I recognize that some of you may have your eyes shut while I preach today, and I will not assume you're sleeping. I know that some of you have a hard time looking at God's colors of maroon and silver. I know that. And so that's okay. It's okay uh, if, if you do that. You know, too many people try to do life uh, alone. Too many people are not engaged uh, with the church. And the church, uh, when I say church, I'm not talking about New Life Assembly. Uh, I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about the church, which is a group of people that is spread out all over the globe. And too many people are just not engaged. This is a, a, a thought that uh, is going to be recurring through over the course of the next several weeks. Jesus didn't go to Calvary so that you could get to heaven. If that is why you think Jesus went to Calvary, you're missing out. That's part of it, but that's not all there is. There's a whole lot more until you get to eternity that God expects you to be engaged in. And Christ went to Calvary so that we could experience eternal life now. Eternity doesn't start later. We... we you will never lose consciousness. You're either going to be conscious forever in hell or you're going to be conscious forever in heaven. And so this life is intimately connected uh, with eternity. There uh, are usually far too few uh, in the body of Christ who are engaged with what God is doing. Uh, in fact, one of the illustrations, you've probably heard it before, you know, uh, most local churches uh, like ours uh, are a lot like a, a lot like a football stadium with a football game going on. There are 22 people desperately in need of rest on the field playing the game, and there's 80,000 people in the stands desperately in need of exercise. That's a very fitting illustration of the church. We need to have, we, we want to challenge you to get in the game. Uh, if you're in the game, uh, you, you're probably doing too much. You can't do 100 things well. Just because the church wants to do something doesn't mean you should be the first one to sign up. If you're doing 100 things for Jesus, you need to stop doing some things for Jesus because you're not doing anything well. That's just true. You're limited. You got to find out what God is specifically calling you to. He's given you gifts. He's given you natural talents and abilities. And when we begin to discover those things, we figure out where we belong, if you will, when we get in the game. So... Uh, in this series, uh, we're going to be really um, looking at the whole concept of never alone. In fact, that's one of uh, the, we, you've heard, maybe you've heard uh, some of us talking about culture statements uh, here and there throughout the last uh, few months. Um, a culture statement, uh, when you hear that term, it is where we want to get. It's where we are not, but it's where we want to get. The culture, you have a culture to your life. It's the way you do things. If you're not hospitable, when people come to your door, the culture that they get is go away, right? If you're hospitable, when people come to your door, the culture that they receive is, please come on in. Uh, this church has a culture. And one of the areas the, that we want to uh, see change, we want to see a culture shift, uh, is in the area of never alone. In other words, we don't ever want to be doing anything by ourselves. When there is something to do for Jesus, no matter how small it is, we want at least two people engaged, never alone. It's all part of the idea of teams. God uh, never intended for you to be a lone ranger. 
Uh, you know, in fact, it's interesting. It's, you know, the Lone Ranger, it's an oxymoron because he wasn't alone. He had Tonto, right? Yeah, he had Tonto. Not even Jesus tried to do the Father's work by himself. Think of that. Not even Jesus tried to do the Father's work by himself. And so the reality is, I'm better when you're involved with my life, and you're better when I'm involved with your life because we are the church. And this community is better when we together are engaged moving God's agenda forward. Where we work, first of all, that's the primary platform and mission field that God has given you, your vocation. Involvement in the local church. The local church is ground zero in every community for what God is doing and what God wants to do through through groups of people and teams of people. Now, here's what we know. Teams can divide. (laughs) If you go to the Super Bowl, you know, you've got, you know, half of the state. Actually, college is better. Uh, College football is much better. Their fan bases are much better in terms of, like, when they give you the aerial shot of the stadium, you've got, you know, the blue and gold over here and the maroon and silver over here. Why? Because there's a division. Part of that makes sense because, you know, if everybody was wearing blue, then, you know, you don't know who's on your team, and that's kind of the point of jerseys uh, and all of that, that kind of thing. Uh, but teams can divide. In fact, you should have heard the chatter uh, uh, this morning with the worship team because we had some Bronco fans on the worship team. Uh, uh, we had, you know, the motorcycle uh, uniform up here on the platform. We had uh, the Cats. We had the Buffalo Sabres. Woot, woot! That's a hockey team, by the way, that you may not have heard of. They're actually professional. Uh, but my, uh, my wife is wearing one of, one of my hockey jerseys. Uh, and so, so we had, and what, what was interesting is uh, Pastor Steve, of course, has his Raiders jersey, or T-shirt on, his Raiders colors. And man, it's amazing how teams divide, isn't it? You know, the, the Yankees, nobody likes the Yankees. Why? Because teams bring division. I like the Yankees, by the way especially back in the early 2000s, before some of you maybe were born. Uh, But listen, teams, while they may divide, they also unite. In fact, every championship team is a true team because that team has unity. But what, what free agency has done to professional sports, and now it's trickling down into college athletics, what free agency has done is it's It's the athlete goes to the highest bidder. It is no longer about the team. It is about the player. It is about the superstar. American culture wants you to believe that you are not as good together. You are better by yourself. That's why there is, you want to talk about a real pandemic? It's the pandemic of loneliness and aloneness, especially in our younger generations. Never have we had more access to connectedness and been a more lonely culture. Why? In part because the trillion-dollar industries of athletics promote superstars. In fact, think about your own life. You want to turn the TV on. You want to find the podcast that's got what? The Christian Superstar. You want that guy that, you know, everybody's following. It's not his fault that I have that attitude towards him, but that's where I go because that's part of the American culture. But you see, we are better together. We are better as a team. And the scriptures could not be more, uh, uh, exempl- could not exemplify this more. In fact, go to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, right at the end of chapter 1, beginning of chapter 2. And God saw the man, and he saw that he was alone, and he saw that this was not good. It's not good for you to be alone. It's not good for me to be alone. We need each other. Think about kings in, in ancient uh, countries, and think about, think about nations today. They have to form alliances. Why? Because they know they're stronger together. Think about armies. What's one of the things that, that we hear, we don't know much, uh, but, but, but what do we hear about like Navy SEALs and Army Rangers and those types of things? We don't call them the, the SEAL individuals and the SEAL superstars. We call them SEAL Team 6. SEAL Team. That's what we call them. Why? Because they understand it's about the guy on their left and their right. And they will give their life for those people. Why? 
because they understand something about teams that many of God's people don't understand. Think about the disciples in the New Testament. Think about Noah and his family. For 120 years, they were a team building an ark. And so one of the best and and earliest examples that we have in the scriptures uh, with regard to the need for teams on a larger scale is in the life of Moses. Moses brings the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt. Uh, In chapter uh, 14, uh, they, they go ahead. Chapters 14 and 15, they cross the Red Sea. The Egyptians are drowned, and there's Miriam. She goes uh, uh, and finds the course sheets, uh, you know, for, for the band, and, and then the band begins to play. That's not true, by the way. Uh, uh, she begins to say, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider fell into the sea. That's how we sing that passage of Scripture, uh, one of those 1990s uh, worship choruses that we used to sing. Uh, the Lord my God, my strength, my song has now become my victory. It comes out of Exodus 14 and 15. The Egyptians have been drowned. The Egyptians have been defeated. God has worked supernaturally. And so Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, comes and he visits and he says, man, God has been good to you. And then we come to chapter 18 in the book of Exodus. And let's pick it up uh, with verse 13. Uh, Here's what Jethro observes and then speaks to Moses. The next day, Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. They waited before him from morning till evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw that what Moses was doing for the people, he asked, What are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? Moses replied, Because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. And when a dispute arises, they come to me and I am the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. Sounds like parenting, doesn't it? Imagine doing that with over a million people. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. Verse 17, this is not good, Moses' father-in-law explained. You exclaimed, you are going to wear yourself out and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now, listen to me. And let me give you a word of advice and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative to God, bringing their disputes to him. Teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. But select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,150 and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them Bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making this task easier for you. If you follow this advice, and if God commands you to do so, then you'll be able to endure the pressures, and all these people will go home in peace. And Moses actually, as it goes on to say, Moses says this is a good idea, and that's exactly what he does. The burden is too big for you. You're going to wear yourself out. You know if you try to parent alone without the help of your spouse as a team, That that's disastrous because you get worn out when you're trying to do everything. We know it here in the local church context. When we got just a few people trying to do everything, what happens? They get burned out. And it, it all goes back to this idea of teams. But let's go to the New Testament and let's look at Jesus. I've already alluded to him, but let's go to uh, Luke chapter 10. In chapter 9, Jesus has sent out the 12 disciples. We get to chapter 10, here's what it says. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Then go down to verse 16. They, he gives them some more instructions. He said, then he said to his disciples, anyone who accepts uh, your message is also accepting me, and anyone who rejects you is rejecting me, and anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us. When we use your name, yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. 
Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. So here's Jesus. He's trying to reach all of Palestine, and he says, I cannot do this on my own in my humanity. I need you. And so he sends out the 12, and then he's got 72 others that he sends out. We also know there was a group of 500. What's it all about? It's about working together, <clears throat> excuse me, as teams. Getting in the game will help you and me to live like Jesus. If you want to be like Jesus, get in the game. Engage with God in what he is doing in you and around you, and specifically, think about being engaged in the local church. What can I do? What, what are we trying to do? All of these types of things that go with, with, with vision and direction. If people don't get in the game, it cannot be accomplished. Instead of playing, you know, football, we end up being like six-man football, where you play special teams, defense, offense, and it's 15 yards for a first down. It's an 80-yard field, and it's just a run and gun. And you got 61 to 54 kind of scores. That's not how God designed us to function. We have limitations. We need each other. So in these two passages, I want to point out to you, and, and it, it works into a wonderful uh, acronym uh, here for you, T-E-A-M. There are at least four things that will happen in the life of somebody who chooses to get in the game. And that's right. It is your choice. You know, as I, when I was in high school, uh, of course, I went to power class C school, so the peer pressure was to play, you know, football basketball, and track. And the only thing I did was basketball. Never made any sense to me to do track, just run around in circles and never get anywhere. It still doesn't make sense to me. It just defies logic. So I, I never did that. Uh, and football, I was puny. I was five foot two and 95 pounds as a freshman in high school. That's not going to work. They didn't have a helmet small enough. <laughs> you know. And but kids today will, with that kind of size, they'll still try to play. So basketball is just where I stood. And I made the choice to go against the grain, as it were, and, 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 and do that. I didn't just go with the flow and try to be a part of every team. I said, well, I'm going to just be specific to basketball. See, I had to make a choice. And you have to make a choice as to whether or not you're going to get in the game. So let's look at this acronym and these four things uh, that, that happen uh, to us when we get in the game and when we join the team. And that can be the team of the family of God uh, on a larger scale or one of, one of the teams that we are currently uh, forming, one of the teams that we have formed over the last 12 years, uh, or 12 years, 12 months. Uh, uh, you guys are like, what? 12 years? What's he talking about? Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, so uh, over the last 12 months, uh, it could be a team that exists or a team that we need to get in motion here at New Life, all of these kinds of things. So number one is training. When you get in the game, you receive training. Now, to train means to uh, give discipline and instruction, to practice. That's what it means to train. Verse 20 of Exodus 18, look what Moses said. Teach them God's decrees. Teaching, that's training. What was Jethro saying? He was saying, Moses, you got to teach these people what to do. Now, think about Jesus. Jesus and the 72, did he just grab 72 random people with no instruction and no pattern and say, go do it? No. They had been following him. They had been watching him. They had been doing life with him. For what purpose? He had been training them. He had been training them so that he could send them out. Everybody has spiritual gifts. Everybody has natural abilities. Everybody has natural talents. And as you discover those in your life, you begin to find out where you belong. I have a gift for teaching. I like to, to make things plain to people. I like to take the truth of God's word and explain it to people. Like it just, it revs me up. I love to do it. I like to think systematically. And so that's, you know, God knows what he's doing. And so he called me to be a pastor. And that fits with my gifts. It fits with my natural talents and abilities. 
When you join a team, when you lead a team, if you've been a part of a team, whether it's an athletic team or a team at work or a team in a church, you get trained to do your job. You don't just show up on game day and say, hey, uh, you be the receiver and uh, you snap the ball. No, it's training. It's practice. It's about teaching. Secondly, we get equipping. We not only receive training, but we receive equipping. That's the E in team. To equip means to provide whatever is necessary to accomplish the task. So not only do we receive the training, we get the practice, we go through it, but we, we receive everything we need. You know, uh, the football season, the college football season kicked off uh, this last week, and, and yesterday the Cats played and the Grizz played, and you know what was there at the game? I mean, an enormous amount of footballs. Do you know why? Because those players needed to be equipped to contest with each other, and they need a ball. So they've been given that ball to be able to play the game. God has equipped us. God equips you. He has equipped you to go to work and to be a representative of his while you are at work. He is training you. He is equipping you. You are learning. And we're not just, it, it can't just be about learning about Jesus. If there's anything that we have in the body of Christ, it's a bunch of overfed and under-exercised Christians. Let's have another Bible study. How about not? How about we do something for Jesus? We know a lot about him. Now let's do something for him. And this is what Exodus 20, the second half of the verse says. Moses or Jethro said, teach them. But then he said, show them how to conduct their lives. This is equipping. Show them, Moses. This is exactly what Jesus did in the New Testament as well, Luke chapter 10. But look what Jesus said before uh, he, left, uh, he left the earth. Look how Jesus has equipped us, John chapter 16 and verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about equipping you by giving you what you need to fulfill his purpose through your life on this earth. He has given you his Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You're going to be my witnesses after what? After you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. I am going to equip you to give you what you need to do what I've asked you to do. Ask any athletic coach and they will talk to you gladly about the training and the equipping of their players. That's why they have a playbook. It's, what, it's why they have practice. It's about the training and the equipping. Thirdly, when we get in the game, we receive accountability. Uh, enough on that. We don't like to talk about that. Let's go to number four. No. No, we got to talk about this because this is what is sorely lacking in the world today. We need to do a better job here at New Life of holding ourselves accountable to each other. But you know why we don't? Because we don't trust that we love each other. So there's another thing we got to fix. If somebody comes to me, and I have had people here in this church, because they love me, they come to me to correct me. And I have to get over my proud insecurities that say, how dare you correct me? I have to humble myself and understand that they are not my enemy. They are here to hold me accountable. I'll never forget it on a Sunday night. I hadn't been here very long. The platform was actually back to here. We hadn't put the extension on yet. And I was preaching up a hellfire service. Hellfire and brimstone on a Sunday night. Because that's what you did back then. And I had, had spoken a verse uh, and, and had, had communicated uh, a meaning of a verse uh, and one of our elder statesmen here in the church came up to me afterwards. He opened his Bible, and I knew that in my 20-somethings, he, this could uh, be accountability right here. And he sat me down on the altar, and he opened the Word of God, and he said, that verse is interpreted by this verse, and here is what it means, and that is not what you said. 
then I received that correction. And I still think about it and feel real small. Because that, that's kind of what accountability does to us. But we got to get past those feelings because those feelings of, of being small, that's the devil. God is the one who when we love each other and we want the best for each other and we want the team to function at the highest level, he is the one who holds us accountable. Did you know that you will stand and give an account for your individual life? You will stand before Jesus and give an accounting for the life that you lived on this earth. The scriptures teach us that. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's accountability. In, in verse 17 of Luke 10, it tells us that the disciples returned to Jesus and they were ecstatic that they had seen what, uh, at what God was doing. Jesus had trained them. He had equipped them. He had sent them out. And, and here they come. They come back. Man, the demons are subject to us in your name. The miraculous is happening. And Jesus puts things in perspective. And he says, hey, it's awesome that God, that, that God is working through you. But don't get puffed up in what God is doing through you. Remember what Jesus did, what I'm doing for you. That God has sent his Redeemer and that your name can be written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, that, that reminds us of what Jesus has done for us, not what we have done for God. If I'm just all caught up with what I've done for God, then I'm the center of my life. I need to get caught up with Jesus and all that he has done for me. That's what keeps us humble. That's accountability. We see this in the New Testament. When, when the missionaries in the, in, in the book of Acts, when they would be sent out to different places, what were Paul and Silas and Timothy and, uh, uh, and all of those, and Barnabas, what were they doing? They would go out and then they would come back. They would come back to the people who had sent them. Why? To be held accountable for what they had done while they were traveling. All of these flags right here are countries where we send money every month. Because we have missionaries in these countries. And you know what they do every month? They send us newsletters. Every three or four years, they will call and see if we've got an opportunity for them uh, to come uh, and tell us what God is doing uh, in Togo, if it's Mary Ballinger, uh, in Tanzania, if it's Nate and Tammy Lashway, in U Ukraine, uh, you know, in, in Kosovo, if it's the Fries, if it's the Johnsons in Brazil. I mean, the whole nine yards. What is that all about? Some of us are like, oh, there's a missionary today. Why would we be that way? Because a team player understands the necessity and the importance and the godliness and the power and the supernatural that flows through accountability. We need to hear what God is doing in other parts of the world. We need to hear that. And that's why we follow that example here at New Life and in the Assemblies of God. And so accountability is a huge, huge thing. So when we get in the game, we receive training, we receive equipping, we get accountability. And number four, we receive maturity. Maturity. If you don't want to grow up, then by all means, don't join a team. <laughs> how many of you just hope your kids stay six? How about, how many of you hope your kids just stay 15 forever? Uh-huh. How many of you are glad you are not 15 forever? Living, still living with your mom and dad. Oh my gosh. I mean, I just about put my parents in the grave for three, four years of my life. I knew everything. They knew nothing. I mean, it was just that whole thing. But then I began to understand some things about how foolish I was and how wise they were. You got to humble yourself and come back. And what is that? that that's maturity. That's what happens. It's time for you and me to take the next step in our spiritual growth. You see, when you join a team, you position yourself to grow spiritually. This is so important. Think about Moses. For Moses and the children of Israel, they needed teams of leaders to get into place so that they could mature as a brand new free nation. They had been released from the Egyptians telling them what to do. America experienced the same thing in the 1700s. As they became a new nation, we needed leaders and we needed people, we needed teams of people to help us mature as a younger nation so that we could become 
all that we needed to be. The disciples had learned from Jesus. They did what he had given, uh, what he had taught them. They used the tools that he had given them, and it helped them to grow up in their faith. They experienced different ways of doing things. It's about maturity. You'll never become more like Jesus if you don't get in the game. How do you learn how to witness? You can go to all the seminars you want, but until you learn to witness, until you step out there and make some mistakes and turn some people off, those are the opportunities for you to mature. We don't try to do those things, but when they happen, it brings maturity to our lives. This last week, I was in the bank, and I was doing my transaction there at the window. I had gone inside, uh, <clears throat> and I turned around, and I recognized this guy behind me. Uh, he, he came sporadically to the youth ministry like 23 years ago when we were here, and he's now a small business owner uh, here in town, and uh, we made some small talk, and then as I was wrapping up, and as we were, he was coming to the window where I was, and we were passing each other, he said, hey, man, you got to stop into the shop sometime. Guess what I'm going to be doing? In fact, why don't you hold me accountable for this week? Next week, ask me if I went. Because I'm going to go there this week. I'm going to go to his shop because he invited me. Why? Because I shared Jesus with him when he was a teenager, and we don't talk much about Jesus. And so I'm going to go to his shop because, you see, it wasn't him who invited me into his shop. I recognize that God is opening a door. And I don't know what's behind that door, but I'm going to step through that door because that man needs Jesus. And that's why I'm going. You've probably had maybe some similar things. That's how you learn. It's how you grow spiritually by putting your faith into action. James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. So, so far here at New Life, over the course of the last year, we've been working on uh, forming five different teams, the hospitality team, the communications team, the care team, uh, the media and tech team, and the community outreach team. And of course, last Wednesday at the barbecue, we had a few of those teams kind of come together. Uh, I want to let you know, I had nothing to do with that event. I intentionally took my hands off. Why? Because I know myself. I know that I'm like Moses. And I just want to try to do it all. I'm that annoying volleyball player that tries to play every position. Yeah, that's me. And so you know what I did? I intentionally stepped back. I, I told Carmen and Steve months ago, I want to have as little to do with this as absolutely possible. And that's why it was so much better than anything we've ever done for a summer barbecue. That's why. My job was casting the vision to the team leaders and helping with some of the initial organization and just hearing them and that kind of thing. But they're the ones that ran with it. And it's all about getting in the game. It's, it's the beauty of what can happen. So if your spiritual gifts and your heart for God aim in one of those five directions, take the first step and call the office this week. Hey, how do I get uh, contacted with the communications team? What's that all about? Hey, how do I get connected with the care team? Hey, how do I get connected with the media and tech team? And we will gladly connect you because that's the first step. That's you getting out of the bleachers. That's you getting into the game. There are so many more teams to come, and we're, we're going to be we're going to be working on them. We've got some teams in place that, that we're going to shore up uh, and 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 make better uh, as well. But may all, all of our teams be our um, may they be an opportunity for us to get in the game and to get involved with what Jesus is doing in Central Montana. Stephen Ambrose has, has written uh, a lot of uh, uh, historical books. I don't know how many of you are familiar with his writings, but uh, he's, he's kind of a go-to uh, when we read about American history uh, in particular. And uh, he wrote uh, some things about Lewis and Clark. We are all familiar uh, with Lewis and Clark uh, and their expedition uh, out west uh, here in Montana, we're familiar with Great Falls and the months that it took them to get. We, we're, we're, we drive across the Missouri River. We think, what are, what are they doing? It took them months. Well, Ambrose writes this about Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery that they headed up. Listen, listen to these words. What Lewis and Clark and the men of the Corps of Discovery had demonstrated is that there's nothing that people cannot do if they get themselves together and act as a team. Here you have 32 men who had become so close, so bonded, 
that when they heard a cough at night, they instantly knew who was sick. They could see a man's shape in the dark, and they knew who it was. They knew who liked salt on his meat and who didn't. They knew who was the best shot, the fastest runner, the one who could get a fire going quickest on a rainy day. Around the campfire, they got to know about each other's parents and loved ones and each other's hopes and dreams. They had come to love each other to the point where they would have sold their lives gladly to save a comrade. They had developed a bond, become a band of brothers, and together they were able to accomplish feats that still astound us to this day. Now, if a group of 32 people can traverse most of America, the western half, and do what they did, and it be said about historians that they did things, they accomplished things that are hard to imagine today. I wonder what God's people can do together if they will get in the game and function as a team. What could we do in the power of the Holy Spirit? What could we do if we aimed our lives in a fresh new way? If we're already involved at saying, you know what? I am not going to put 10% of my energy 10 different places. I'm putting all of my energy into that one place. It would change things for you. It would change things for me. Some of you are thinking, well, that can never happen. And oh, you of little faith, believe the best. We're talking about Jesus here. Ephesians chapter 4, and I close with this. Verses 11 through 16. Listen to what Paul says. These are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then when we then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind and new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body of the church. He, that is Jesus, makes the whole body fit together perfectly like a team. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Friends, Paul summarized what we've been talking about today. This is what happens when we get in the game. And what I want to challenge you to do this week for the next seven days is pray Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16 over your life, over your household, and over this congregation. I want you to pray, Jesus, make our congregation, make our family, make me fit together perfectly with you. As I do my part, as our household does its part, as our church does its own special work, may it help everybody else grow so that we can all be healthy and growing and full of love. Pray the Word of God into your life as we begin to unpack this Get in the game. Now, some of you are in the game. You're engaged with what God is doing on several fronts. But I wonder if maybe there is a front in your life that you're not telling people about. And God is saying, yeah, Ken, you're doing, you're doing good there. But you know I'm telling you to get in the game here. And you're making every excuse in the book. But God, I don't have people. But God, my talents. But God, my abilities. But Lord, I don't have time. But... One of the things you learn when you're an athlete is that you need to be familiar with all the positions. Because injuries, ejections, all those kinds of things might make you have to play a different position than what you're used to. But if you know the playbook... And if you say yes to what the coach is asking, you can do your part. And you can help the team win. 
And there's no more important team, if we can use that term, than God's team. We got to get in the game. So I want you to search your heart. I want you to pray that verse over your life, your household, and this congregation this week in preparation for next week as we begin to look at some of the biblical examples. Next week, by the way, we'll be in Judges chapter 4, Deborah and Barak. It's going to be awesome. It's about getting in the game. And I think we've got some Deborahs and we've got some Baraks that need to get in the game. Will you stand with me this morning? Don't close your eyes because I might throw this to you. I just want to see who's going to be my receiver. Jesus, we give you thanks for today. And Lord, it's just a different way of thinking about your kingdom and what you're doing. But God, we know that you have so much more planned for Central Montana. We know, God, that in dark times we are a light that shines in that darkness. And so Jesus, today as we go from this place, we are asking you, to make us fit together perfectly as you have designed. May we each do our own special work. May we help each other grow so that we as the whole body can be healthy and growing and full of love. And God, as this begins to happen in some fresh and new ways in our lives and in our congregation and here in our communities, Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see what you are doing. And Lord, that we would see the works of the devil destroyed and the kingdom of God built in these very short days before your soon return. We give you all the thanks and the praise for it in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you as you go today. Get in the game.